It's great to have everybody out here with us this morning for the, for the Sunday morning services here at the Vernon Church of Christ. Uh, we'd love to have you back at any time possible. Uh, if you're visiting with us or a regular member, we've got our attendance cards in the back of the pews. Please fill those out and we've got baskets in the front and in the back back there that you can drop those in so we can have a record of your attendance. Uh, this morning on the sick list, we've got Miss Martha McReynolds, that's Tammy Barden's mother. She's moving into Generations for a 21 day rehab stint. Uh, we've got Danny Ross Johnson, that's John Ross Johnson's dad. He's back at Generations. Uh, Looks like he'll begin dialysis three times a week, starting here in the near future. We got Miss Frankie Wallace's brother, David Stewart. He's in the hospital in Tupelo. They've requested prayers for him. Uh, we need to remember our shut-ins. We've got Miss Robbie Collins, Miss Lola Mae Edwards, Miss Linda Livingston, Miss Jean McGee, Miss Liz Randolph, Miss Josie, Miss Norma Stanford. Uh, let's remember those in our prayers each and every day. We've got uh, the congregation here at Vernon would like to extend sympathy to the, the family of Cheney Livingston. She was the Lamar County High School senior that passed away in a wreck earlier this week. Her memorial services were at 3 o'clock this afternoon up at the high school. Uh, let's also remember the, the faculty and staff and students at Lamar County High School because they're a close-knit group up there. Uh, as far as upcoming events, we've got our senior reception tonight for our high school graduates. Uh, be after the PM service. Everyone's invited and everyone can bring a finger food. Uh, we don't turn down free food. Uh, Starting this week, he, uh, the Vernon congregation will be in charge of the devotional services at Generation. Group one's in charge today. Uh, that'll be at three o'clock this afternoon. Uh, if you're interested in helping with that, I believe you see Landon with that. Uh, he'll be glad to line you up to help with anything. Uh, this morning's service will Brother Landon Olson will be leading our singing. Brother Curtis Heatherly will have our prayer. Brother Nathan Murphy will have our contribution. Brother Joe McNeese will do our Lord's Supper. Brother Eddie Finch will do our sermon. Uh, let's remember our services tonight at five, and then again Wednesday night at seven. Let's uh, try to be back as often as possible as we can there. If y'all will bow with me and let's pray for the sick and the shut-in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer. Thank you that we can come and pray for those that are in need of you watching over them. We pray that you'll be with those that are sick, those that we've mentioned here today, Miss Martha, Danny Ross, Mr. David. Be with those that we don't know about and be with all those that are tending to their needs. Uh, be with our shut-ins and let them have a good day. Let them uh, have a good day that they will, they will be able to enjoy. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with those that have lost loved ones. Pray that you will tend to them, tend, watch over them and be with them. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go out the, throughout this service, we pray that everything that we do here this morning will be in your will. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first th song this morning will be number 316. 316, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing the first and third verses of this song. <clears throat> Let's sing. What
be reading from Proverbs 12, 25. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Shall we pray? And dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the many material blessings that thou hast uh, bestowed on us. And at this time, let us give back a portion of what we have uh, received with a cheerful and helpful heart. In Christ's name, amen. To prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll be singing number 186, Holy, Holy, Holy. We'll sing the first and fourth verse of this song. Let's sing. Holy, Holy, time that you've set aside for us to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. As we take this bread, we ask that you would help us as we reflect on the, the humiliation and betrayal and the pain that he went through for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we're thankful this morning that Jesus was willing to shed his blood and die on the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sins. As we take this cup, I pray, Father, that you would help us to fully appreciate the great opportunity that we have because of his death, burial, and resur resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray.
Let us all pray together. Father, you are our King and our God. Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers. And Father, in you, loving Father, we have put our trust. And thank you for this time of the year, Father, when nature wakes up and comes alive again, just as your son did. And loving Father, thank you for this country that we live in, where we are free to worship you, the only true and living God. And Father, thank you, loving Father, for this memorial feast that we have just partaken of. Father, to our hearts are very saddened that your son had to die so that we may be able to partake of it. But our souls rejoice in what it did by for us. And Father, thank you for letting us be born in this time, in this place, in history, and in this town of Vernon, your congregation. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with the ability to be a member of this congregation. We pray, loving Father, each one of us will do our part to help it grow and to do your will. Father, please be with those that we know of that are sick. Please be with uh, Miss Martha Mac Reynolds, Sister Tammy's mother. Be with Brother Danny or Danny Ross Johnson, John Ross's daddy. Be with David Stewart, Sister Frankie Wallace's brother. And anyone else, Father, that we may not know of at this time that needs our prayers, pray, Father, that they would have them. And Father, be with Sister Robbie Collins, Sister Lola Mae Edwards, Sister Linda Livingston, Sister Jean McGee, Sister Joe C., and Sister Norma Stanford. Be with all of, all of them, Father, and bless them with a peaceful and restful day. And loving Father, Above all things, we thank you for your son Jesus, for his love for us, for his willingness to come and be a mortal man just as we are and to show us how to live with you forever in heaven. And Father, some 2,000 years ago, the world thought that they were through with him, but he was only just beginning to show us how much he truly loves us. And loving Father, please forgive us of all the sin that's in our lives. Father, we're weak. We're sinful. And the temptation to sin takes us away at times. And we pray that you would please forgive us of those times. All these things, loving Father, we humbly pray in your Son's holy name, Jesus. Amen. Our next song will be number 584, 584, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. We'll sing the first and fifth verse of this song. <clears throat> Let us sing. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way.
Sometimes when it comes to living the Christian life, we have doubts. I don't really know why we have those doubts, but sometimes we do. I know I have asked or heard that Christian's comment before when he asked, are you going to heaven? And they'll say, well, I hope so. Well, that's a sign of doubt when they say, well, I, I hope so, a sign of doubt about that. And you ask, well, why do you have that doubt? It may be that sometimes they have the the doubt, has God really forgiven me of my sins? All my sins? Has God really forgiven me of my sins since I became a Christian? Because, you know, I've done some pretty horrendous sins since then. Has God forgiven me? Will God forgive me? And in some ways that comes about to bring about doubt that we have in our relationship with God about, I just don't know. Isn't it something how you might ask one person that, you believe you're going to heaven, they'll say, well, I hope so. Then you ask another person the same question, and they'll say, oh, yeah, no problems here. How can there be such a vast difference when a person may say, I hope so, to a person who has 100% confidence that heaven's going to be their home? Why does that happen sometimes? Because God does not want us to be living in a, a time of doubt, because doubt can bring about misery. It can make us miserable. Don't, knowing that, I don't know, I don't know. God doesn't want that. He wants us to know that heaven can and will be our home if we choose to follow him. He wants us to know that. Now here's how one person said it. We have no proof that we're going to heaven because we're not there yet. But what God has given us evidence that the faithful Christian will be in heaven one day. Well, sure, we're not there yet. And we're here. And so one can't say, well, I know I'm going to be there because I'm here. But yet at the same time, God has given us plenty of evidence in the scriptures to tell us that for the faithful Christian, heaven will be our home. That we don't have to have doubts when it comes to living everyday life. We don't have to have that. And think about it, doubt is not a, it's not a uncommon question that people have even in the Bible. We find individuals there that had doubt, and that doubt was taken care of in different ways. 
And in one such place we find here in Mark chapter 9 and verse 23, a father who had a son, and that son was demon-possessed. He had seizures. He was foaming at the mouth. He was grinding his teeth. The father had tried everything possible to get this demon taken care of. He even carried his son to the disciples, but they could not heal him. So finally, as a last effort, he comes to Christ with his son. And there he says, 923, he said, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now that sounds like a contradiction. How can he say, Lord, I believe, but the same breath say, help my unbelief? Well, this man had some doubts. Had some doubts about many things here. He had tried everything before this, but now Christ is going to help him. He wanted help. He wanted to be stronger. He didn't want to find himself in that situation where he had doubts. And sometimes Christians are that way as well. Oh, we believe, but sometimes because of things happening, doubts have a way of sinking in and creeping in. And we want a stronger faith. We want to walk better with God every day. But yet we don't want to have this doubt that can rob us of the happiness of salvation. So there's one example of a man, and I'm sure that when Christ cast out that demon, oh, he believed. There was no longer any unbelief in him whatsoever. All doubt had been taken away. He was now a true believer that Christ was the Son of God. When we come further in about Luke chapter 17, we have an instance where Christ is having a discussion with his disciples. And the discussion is over forgiveness. And he tells his disciples here, he said, if, if a brother sins against you, you need to go to him and talk with him, and if he repents, forgive him. Well, that sounds good. But then Christ carried it one step further, and he said, if your brother sins against you seven times in the same day, you go to him, and if he repents, you forgive him seven times. Now, this is something that the uh, disciples never heard before. What do you mean? Seven times in a day, really meaning indefinite, every how many times they've come against you. They never heard that, and they were going to have problems with that. So there in Luke 17 and verse 5, and the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Even in this instance of, of, of learning forgiveness and offering forgiveness and extending forgiveness, they had a problem. They wanted their faith to be increased so they wouldn't have a problem with that. And we need as well when it comes to forgiveness. We can learn a lot from these individuals. It may be that sometimes we have a lesser faith when it comes to forgiveness for whatever reason. And maybe we struggle with it. And they say that it's easy to forgive an enemy until you have one. Well, we need to have that increased faith as well. We need to have that. The apostles, they saw a need for it. Christ was helping them to increase their faith. We come a little further, go to Luke chapter 7, and we find a man, the last person you would think that would have any trouble with his faith or doubt, and that was John the Baptist. Here in chapter 7 of Luke, we find John is in prison for teaching truth. He knows that not long his life is going to be taken, his life will be over, and yet how could John have doubt? But he did. And there in prison, he sends two of his disciples to Christ. And there he goes to Christ. They go to Christ. And he wants to know, are you the one? You ask Jesus if he is the one, the Messiah, the promised one. And they go, and here's the answer that Christ gives in verse 20. When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying... Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Well, John, of all people, here he is, been, been teaching Christ for who knows how many years, preparing the way for Christ. And then here he is, he baptizes Christ. And at the baptism of Christ, he hears the voice of God 
say, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. How can it be that John would have any doubts that Christ is the Son of God, is the Messiah, after everything he, he knows about him? But John did. Of all people, that just shows us the human side of John because there in prison, that doubt began to creep in and he wanted assurance. So he sends those disciples and Christ gives him assurance. Tell John what's happening. The sick are being healed, the blind can see, the dead are being raised. And they went back and they told John those things and it had to encourage John to have a stronger faith. All that he'd been doing, it was true, it was right. He had a stronger faith over it. Christ went on to say this about John in verse 28 in Luke 7. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Even Christ says there's not a greater prophet of all the Old Testament prophets than John. And yet John, here we find him, he had some doubts. It could happen. If it could happen to these disciples, if it could happen to John, hey, it can happen to us. But yet the Lord is trying to prepare us to handle that when it comes. And one way he says is in 1 John 5 and verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. John here says, there's no place for doubt. I have written these things that you may know that Christ is the Son of God. That we may know that there should be no place of doubt. There shouldn't be. We have each a Bible. And we can turn to and we can read whenever those doubts come in. And we can figure it out very quickly there's no place for doubt here. As we read, we grow stronger and we become stronger and stronger each day against that doubt. In John 20, in verse 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Again, the reason we have the Bible is so we won't have doubts, so that we can believe 100% he's the son of God, 100% he's going to save those who are prepared himself, and 100% one day he's coming back. And one day we can be with him in heaven. If ever we have doubts, go to the Gospels. Read of Christ. Read of what he did, who he was or any other, other of, their, of the Bible, they help, the scriptures help, they're given to us so that we will not have these doubts that come about from time to time. A good example of this, another good example, we go to the Old Testament and we find Moses who was chosen to lead God's people out of the Egyptian bondage. And he goes to there to the people and he tells them who he is and what he's all about. And then he takes that next step and he goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh doesn't like it. I'm not going to let those people go. They're my slaves. I'll keep them there. Well, after a little persuasion, nine plagues come about. And the Bible tells us after each plague, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. I mean, he got more and more determined. I'm not going to let him go. Well, then here comes the tenth one, the big one, the death of the firstborn. Moses goes out and he tells the people of Israel, here's what you need to do. This plague is coming. Here's what you need to do. And there in Exodus 12 and verse 7, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on, on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then 12, 13, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So here Moses gave them the command. You go out and you kill this lamb. Not just any lamb. It had to be the lamb, a male lamb with no blemish. 
the first one of the mother she's had, so to take that lamb and kill it, and then to take the blood of that lamb and put it over the outside of the door, and then when that plague comes through, that will take the life of a firstborn, that plague will pass by because the plague, the angel, as it's called the death angel, I guess, sees the blood and will pass over that house. Uh, we've heard that story many times, and, and there are other requirements they had to do as well for us about eating that lamb and, and not bringing any out with them and certain herbs they had to eat with it. A lot of things were there. But the main thing here is we're going to look at this morning, we'll see, put the blood over the door. That way that plague will come and bypass, bypass your house. So let's say here it is. It's the evening, getting close to dark. And all the Israel knows about this. They've heard about this. They've seen the other nine. They know this one's coming too. And there's two men outside their, outside their houses talking. And we'll give them two good Jewish names, Smith and Jones. Okay, they're outside talking. And Smith says, what do you think about that plague that's coming? I tell you, it makes me a little nervous. A lot of crazy things have been happening around here lately. I know the water and the blood, and we have all these uh, frogs everywhere and these flies, and darkness came about, and they go, he goes through all of it. He says, I'm nervous about this. I don't want to lose my son. I'm scared. What if I lose my son? I only have one. What's going to happen? And then Jones says to him, you shouldn't be worried. You've done what God said, haven't you? Yeah. Haven't you taken that lamb, that, that, new, uh, that one first year lamb and without blemish and the male lamb? Have you not sacrificed it and, and put the blood over your door? I see it right there. I saw you when you put it on there. And as Jones says to Smith, what's, what's the problem? And Smith says, how can you have that much confidence that nothing's going to happen? How can you have that confidence and Smith says, because I believe God. He told us what he's going to do, or what we are to do, and if we do it, then we're okay. Well, Jones or Smith goes back to his house, and it's getting close to dark. He is coming, and he's, 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 he's nervous. Jones goes to his house, everything's great, he's happy. The night passes. The next morning comes, they both step outside, and which one had a dead son? Neither. No household in Israel lost a son. Every household of the Egyptians lost someone. Why didn't these two men or any of the people of Israel lose a son? Because of the blood. Because of the blood that was over the door. And here was... Mr. Smith, who had his doubts, he was all shaky and nervous. The blood of Christ covered him even. And here's the other guy, the Jones man, and yet he had full confidence. And what did the blood do? It covered him too. And that should give us assurance today because there are going to be times when we're going to have some doubts. There are going to be times when we're going to wonder. But what do we do? We look at the blood. If the blood can cover those the day of Egypt or Israel, it can cover us. We have doubts, that's okay. We're covered by the blood. We got 100% confidence, oh, that's great, that's okay, because we're covered by the blood. That's what the blood of Christ does, and that should help us when we ask the question, am I going to heaven? And we say, I hope so. Remember, we're covered by the blood. Remember that. 1 John 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. His blood cleanses us. We may have some doubts, but remember, if I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm walking in the light, I'm trying to live this faithful life, I've got the blood on my side. It's going to cover me. Romans 5 and verse 9. 
Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. His blood. That's what makes it possible. That on the day of judgment, when we stand before God, that we will not hear his wrath. We will not receive his wrath because we are covered with the blood. And that's what we want. Because one day when God's wrath appears, it's not going to be good if he looks at us and he sees us not covered, not forgiven. That's going to be a terrible day. But for the faithful Christian who's walking in the light, and yeah, we're going to have some doubts from time to time, rest assured we're covered by the blood. You see, that's what it's about. It's all about being covered by the blood of Jesus. When does that covering take place? At baptism. When we are baptized in Christ, that is when the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sins and we remain faithful to God. We walk in that light. We stand before God one day and we will. He'll look and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been covered by the blood. If you're not a Christian, you're not covered. You need to be covered. You need to have your sins washed away. At baptism is when that happens, and we live faithful thereafter. If you're not a Christian, why not do that this morning and be baptized in Christ? I know you believe. Repent of your sins. Confess our Lord's great name and take that step of baptism that puts you into Christ, that gives you that covering, and live faithful. As a Christian... And we can see that i got some doubts. Well, understand what the blood does. And that may help our doubts. Help us to be stronger. When we look back and wonder, I wonder if God forgave that. I wonder if God's going to forgive this or that. He did. If we're walking faithful, covered in the blood. As a Christian, live faithful. As one that's not a Christian, why not put on our Lord in baptism this morning? as we stand and sing our invitation.
have a songbook. Um, turn to number 708. 708. When we all get to heaven, <clears throat> we'll sing all three verses of this song. <clears throat> Let's sing. Sing the wondrous. 